To give us some insight on rye, the grain, and rye, the flour, we have invited Simo Kusisto to join us today. He's a master bread baker from Finland, a country very famous for their use of rye, making him an expert on how to wield the power of this hearty grain. So these are samples of some of the beautiful breads that you make. Yes. Why did you come to America and start making Finnish rye bread? Well, I came here when I was a young man, 20 year old, to see New York. And uh, I went to culinary school here and stayed and uh, worked in restaurants. And I started to pretty fast miss my Finnish rye bread. So only way really to get it was that I had to start making it myself. And here we are. So did you go to Finland to get the rye to? No, I started to bake rye, uh, rye bread with the um, uh, rye from America? North America, oh. right. So first I had rye from uh, San, uh, California, San Francisco, and then I was able to source out to get some local rye from upstate New York. And how does rye flour differ from wheat flour or spelt flour? Rye has less gluten, so you will always have a denser bread. It has 15% fiber. It's very, very high in fiber, which is very 15. healthy, 15% yeah, of yeah. fiber. And since it's a fermented bread dough, you do not need the, all the sodium also in the bread, so you can cut that down. So I only use like half the amount of sodium than other breads. What are the challenges that you face when uh, baking with rye flour? Does it rise easily or does it take a longer time? It does take longer time since it's fermented from a sourdough starter. So you always need to have the starter very strong. And of course, in the weather conditions, when it's winter time, it takes longer time to ferment. Now you brought your starter, it's real heavy. And I was told that this is about how many years old? 50 or 60? This is 50, 60 years old. Yeah. 50 or 60 years old. You can and smell it smells the... so good. It smells a tiny bit sour, and it smells very fresh and like rye, like rye bread. And we're used to in America, the rye bread we have is just rye seeds, basically, right. in, a, in a regular loaf. When I came here, I went to a deli, I saw rye bread, a sandwich. I got so excited yeah. that, oh, I'm going to get my rye bread. Right. And then when I got the sandwich, <laughs> I was so disappointed. So how long did it take you to master the technique of the real rye bread? Uh, it took about a year. You know, it's a very simple recipe. Oh. It just then depends what you do with it. You put a little see. love. I went to Finland. I That's visited what all makers say, a little love. Of course. But there's something else because you're making just incredible bread. Well, this bread, look how beautiful it is. And just that little piece of bread slathered with like a cream cheese and smoked butter, salmon butter. and butter. Oh, yes. And yeah. then a, like a nice mild cheddar cheese and fresh hothouse cucumber oh. slice on top of that. It makes a really refreshing, yeah, delicious. nice little piece. Is there one specific tip that you can offer when uh, baking with rye? Yes. Um, use rye flour, whole grain rye flour, from health food stores. Okay. Don't, do not buy from supermarkets. You, you, you get better flour. And actually, what's different with the rye, grain, and wheat, the wheat, they uh, remove the bran and so forth. But in rye, the whole kernel is used. And so you have all the goodies, all the minerals, vitamins, and that's why it's very, very high in fiber, complex carbohydrates. Well, Simo, thank you very much oh, for sharing your pleasure. knowledge and your delicious breads. And uh, I look forward to having this for lunch. Thank you. Rye, a staple grain in many countries, is enjoying a surge in popularity here in the United States. Once used as a bread staple, rye is now sprouting up in many restaurant kitchens, from cocktails to pastas and even in desserts. I think you'll be surprised at the bold flavor that it brings to the topping for a delicious rhubarb and raspberry crisp. Rhubarb, by the way, is not a fruit, it's a vegetable. And it's an ancient one, cultivated for medicinal purposes in China as long as 5,000 years ago. In the United States, it's most often treated as a fruit, however, and it's also been dubbed the pie plant. The first records of anyone cooking with it date as far back as the 17th century in England, but it really didn't gain in popularity as an ingredient for baking until the early 19th century. And every colonial garden had a patch of rhubarb. By the way, if you're going to grow it, and it's very nice to have in the garden, try to find a variety that has nice red stalks. Look how pretty this is. Now, before you start your crisp, I suggest that you add to one and a half pounds of rhubarb stalks cut up, two thirds of a cup of sugar, 
and let it sit for a half an hour or so. The sugar will cause the juices in the rhubarb to flow a little bit, and you want that juiciness in your crisp. So even before you finish the filling, this is the filling, you can start making the topping. By the way, rhubarb stalks are edible. The leaves are toxic and should be removed. Don't even put the leaves in your compost. It has an oxalic acid in it and it can cause stomach disorders, so throw those away. For the topping, well, this is the crispy topping that we are going to make out of all-purpose flour as well as rye flour. And the rye flour will give it a little bit of a tanginess, which is really, really delicious. So into your food processor. Now you can do this by hand. If you have one of these pastry cutters, you can use this. But I find for biscuits, for uh, crisp toppings, I just use my food processor. So a half a cup of all-purpose flour and a half a cup of rye flour. And half a cup of butter. You can see it's cut into like quarter inch pieces and the butter should be icy cold. And just pulse it just for a, a couple seconds. If the butter is cold, it will cut nicely without getting mushy. That's about right. That's it, you see how many few seconds? It'll take you longer if you do it by hand. And into here, add half a cup of dark brown sugar, a half a cup of oats. Now the oats are what's going to give a nice crunch to your crisp topping. And those are all purpose, regular oats. And a quarter of a cup, if you like, of a kind of a nut. It goes well with walnuts, hazelnuts, these are hazelnuts coarsely chopped, uh, you can add even almonds. And that's cinnamon, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. And this is the topping. You can make a lot of this and freeze it in closed plastic bags or even in quart containers or pint containers in your freezer. And then you can easily make crisps when your berries are ripe. And now, back to the rhubarb. Yeah, it's already showing signs of moisture. Add two tablespoons of all-purpose flour to your rhubarb. That will help thicken the juices. Rhubarb's very juicy when cooked. And for flavor, the zest of a bright-skinned orange. Rhubarb and orange go very well together. And I'm just going to use my little wooden reamer. And now stir this all together and then very carefully fold in your berries. You can use a half a pint of fresh or thawed frozen raspberries, but be careful not to smush them too much. Raspberries are one of the softer berries and we're adding it for color and we're adding it for the tart flavor. And I love to add it to rhubarb. And now fill your ramekins. You can make one simple oval uh, crisp if you like, or you can use pretty little ramekins like this. I love these, and this is a very healthy size. This is a nine ounce ceramic ramekin. So if your guests are hungry and love crisp, this will be a good size for them. And notice I've lined my baking sheet with parchment and butter the ramekins with soft room temperature butter. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees because it should be hot when you put these in the oven. Then the topping. And I sort of like to do this with my fingers. Just squeeze it a little bit in your hand and put a handful right on top. This is a generous amount of topping. This will cook up very crispy, you'll see. And put this right into your oven and bake rotating halfway through the baking time until the topping is browned and crisp and the juices are bubbling in the centers. And that takes approximately 30 minutes. So let these cool a little bit before serving. It's nice to serve with ice cream, whipped cream with sorbet and use your 
lovely ice cream scoop to make a perfect oval of ice cream. Place it on top and serve immediately. Crisps are best served the day they're made, and I think you'll agree that this rhubarb and raspberry crisp hits all the right flavors. Enjoy. Do you want your biscuits light and flaky? Well, they're typically made with a variety of wheat flour that's fine textured and low in both protein and gluten. An alternative way of creating light biscuits is to use half white flour and half whole grain barley flour. That gives you a biscuit that's not only light, but also more wholesome. And now to make a buttermilk barley biscuit that'll make your family love you even more, make sure all of your ingredients, including the flour and the leavener, are cold. So I have two cups of all-purpose flour and two cups of barley flour. It's made from milling pearl barley or whole grain barley that's had its outer husk removed. So you see it's a light coloring and very fine textured. To the dry ingredients, and I'm using a food processor, you can do this all by hand like grandma used to do, but this saves a lot of time and you can make lots and lots of biscuits if you use a food processor. One tablespoon plus one teaspoon of baking powder. Make sure your baking powder is fresh and you know that it's going to rise. Two teaspoons of salt. And I use a coarse kosher salt primarily in my baking. Two tablespoons of sugar. This is already pre-measured. And because we're using buttermilk in these biscuits, you need another kind of leavener, which is baking soda. Just a quarter of a teaspoon. Now sift all those dry ingredients together just by pulsing the machine for a couple seconds. There, everything's nicely mixed. And now add your butter. Two sticks, half a pound of unsalted butter cut into quarter inch pieces. And if it's cold, it's easy to cut it into those small pieces with a sharp knife. And now very quickly pulse these. So that's about it. I find this so quick and so easy and I make lots and lots of biscuits. So here, and I don't add the liquid to the food processor because I can actually mix this all up and put this in the refrigerator covered the day before I have to make my biscuits freshly baked. And now add your buttermilk, one and a half cups of the best buttermilk. And here we have all the buttermilk. So you're actually folding the dry into the wet. And this is done right before baking. You don't want the buttermilk to activate the leavening ingredients, unless you're gonna freeze it. So now you can turn this out onto your board. We're going to do a little bit of laminating, which is really layering of the dough. And just scrape your dough out onto a lightly floured surface. It's best to work the dough cold. And that's why an air-conditioned room is good. And now turn this up and get it all together. Flatten this with the palm of your hand into a rectangle or a square. And then you can fold this into thirds. Preheat your oven to 450 degrees. So now we're going to Laminate the dough once again. This dough flatten into an eight inch square. You can use barley flour as a substitute for part of the flour in a baking recipe for health purposes, of course, and also to achieve certain variations in texture. It's a low fat, low cholesterol grain that's high in complex carbohydrates, in fiber, in protein, and in certain vitamins and minerals. In fact, barley flour offers more than four times the fiber of all-purpose flour. So why not use it? It's important to know, though, that barley flour lacks sufficient gluten for many baked recipes, and that's why I suggest that you really use 50% no more in a recipe. And now, yes, just trim the sides a little tiny bit because these cut edges will rise better than if they were uncut. You can just pat this into a little testing biscuit which you can eat when they come out of the oven. So now cut this into nine 
equal squares. Bake these on a parchment lined baking sheet. And I'll just put this little one on the side for me. Pop them into the oven 18 minutes and I'll show you exactly what they look like. So this is what they look like after 17 or 18 minutes in a 450 degree oven. You can see the layers. They're beautifully browned. And to make them even a little bit more delectable, just brush the tops very lightly with a little bit of unsalted butter that's been melted and cooled. Right out of the oven, do this. This gives them a little shine. So pretty. And then serve them while they're warm. I didn't mention, but if you're going to be serving the biscuits for a strawberry shortcake, for example, instead of buttering them when they come out of the oven, sprinkle the tops with sugar before they're baked. And you will have an amazing little sugar crust on each of the biscuits for your dessert. So beautiful. And would you like to see what they look like inside? Break it this way. They are tender. They can be served just with butter or with a little bit of your favorite jam. Light and flaky, delicious. Just the way a biscuit should be. Enjoy. How about spelt flour for baking? Cake, cream, and berries combine for a whole grain take on a summer celebration cake that's twice as delectable as the sum of its parts. And for many people, it's easier to digest than wheat, despite not being entirely gluten-free. So to make the cake, very simple. Cream in your mixer, two sticks, half a pound of unsalted butter. It's good if the butter has warmed to not quite room temperature, but is not rock hard when you put it in the mixer. And once the butter is broken up, add one and a half cups of granulated sugar. I like to add it slowly so it gets evenly combined with the butter. I always use unsalted butter in my baking because you can control the amount of salt going into the recipe. And I find that unsalted butter usually has the purest flavor and is usually fresher tasting than salted butter. And while that's creaming, you can prepare your dry ingredients. We're using, as I said, spelt flour, three cups. As you notice, spelt flour has a little bit of a brown tinge to it. It's made from a grain that scientists believe may be an ancestor of modern wheat or a subspecies of wheat, but it is good. So I'll put this over here. We need one tablespoon of baking powder. That's your leavening. Egg whites are also a leavening, and we have whole eggs in this, so you can consider them also part of the leavening process. A teaspoon of salt, and just use a whisk to stir those dry ingredients together. The nine inch cake pans have been buttered and floured. They don't have to have a lining in them at all. This is a nice buttery cake, so they will come out of the pans. And spelt has a very high protein content, 13%, like that of whole wheat flour. And it has good nutritional value also. It tastes like whole wheat flour, uh, but it doesn't have any of the bitterness or toughness that whole wheat sometimes has. Use whole large eggs and break them one by one into your creamed butter and sugar. Mm, beautiful. Cream well after each addition of the egg. These are from my hens, and they have the most beautiful colored yolks. We have measured out already our liquid, which is one and a quarter cups of whole milk and two teaspoons of the best vanilla you can find. I'm going to add the vanilla right to my milk. That is our liquid. This is our dry and you add them at medium speed, alternatively. A little dry, a little wet. So there, that took all of six minutes or so. And then add the batter in each of the two cake pans. I think using a scale is really the most accurate way for determining an equal division of 
batter, dough, whatever. And now using a spatula, you can just spread this out in a nice even layer in your pan. Oh, and prepare your oven by preheating it to 350 degrees. And I would suggest making this cake several times, you can freeze the layers very nicely so that you will always have cake layers in your freezer, well wrapped, ready to layer with a simple filling of whipped cream and berries. Okay. Right into the oven, rotate the pans halfway through baking until the cakes are golden brown and a cake tester inserted in the center comes out clean. And these will be done in 30 to 35 minutes. Set your timer. So look how nicely the cakes have come out of the pan, have cooled. Put them on your cake stand. So this is the bottom layer. We're gonna fill with cream and berries. Put the top layer on, fill with cream and berries. And I don't take off this beautiful raised portion. If I were doing a very fancy layered cake, I might trim this so that it's nice and flat, but this is a casual summertime cake, so you don't have to take away any of the beautiful cake itself. So two cups of heavy cream. Buy the best heavy cream you can find and whip it up with a little bit of turbinado sugar. You can do this with a wire whisk, an egg beater, a hand mixer, or your stand mixer. And turbinado sugar is basically like a raw sugar. It's amber-hued, less refined than white sugar, and it has a very gentle, light molasses flavor. And make sure, too, that your cream is very cold. There. Plenty good. So about half this cream is going to go in the middle, and the other half on top, and just lightly spread it. Mm, so pretty. And spread about half the berries, about one and a third cups of raspberries, strawberries, plump blueberries. Pretty. And then your second layer, and what I like about this cake too, look how firm it is. You can pick it up, it doesn't fall apart as you pick it up. And for stability, one bamboo skewer right in the center, uh, just to hold it if you're gonna be taking it from one room to another or from inside to outside. And then of course, before serving, remove that bamboo skewer. It's so pretty. Looks so fresh and beautiful. I hope you all enjoy making a cake with spelt flour. You'll certainly enjoy this lovely light summer treat. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time on Martha Bakes. I brought my Finnish rye bread to make Finnish open face sandwiches. First, spread some butter, add mild cheddar, a couple slices, and hothouse cucumber. A few slices on top, yeah, cucumber and cheese sandwich, and then I have smoked salmon, honey Dijon mustard, a little fresh dill, and here we go. Voila!